Northfield, Connecticut, my first time doing radio shows in Northfield. All right. Um, go to salescalloverhaul.com to join our Facebook group and to get your chance at the $1,100 giveaways of the sales call overhaul package. We give away these sales call overhauls. Basically, we uh, take your recorded sales call, we transcribe it, timestamp it, give detailed notes on everything that needs to improve, basically rebuild it from the ground up into a process that will close 10% higher in five calls flat or your money back. And it'll do so in a zero pressure process so that you do not have to become a hardcore, high ticket, high pressure closer kind of person. You can be you with this kind of process. So go to sales call overhaul and submit your recorded sales calls to win that, or you can buy those as well on that same website. Um, do we have a guest lined up for next week, Jason? It is Carlos Redlick. Carlos Redlick. Wonderful. He is a copywriter and we are looking mm. forward to speaking with him. That's good. I, I do know Carlos. Good. All right. Well, um, take it away, Jason. Well, so... Ken Caesar, super excited <laughs> to have you here. We have had some great conversations over the years. I first uh, ran into Ken when he got some sales training from me way back in the long ago time around 2013. So I've known nice. him for five years and he, uh, well, the first thing he did was went out and built a business bigger than mine yeah, <laughs> and awesome. scaled it up and then uh, ran into, and we're going to talk about some more stories here today nice. about what happens when you take a web design agency, learn how to sell five figure web design projects, which many people do not know how to do. Mm -hmm. And what kind of problems do you have in scaling when you get there? How do you keep mm -hmm. making money? So, and it turns out it's trouble. <laughs> so he got out of that and went into e-commerce a couple of years ago and he's done the same thing there, <laughs> built it up cool. so that it, it has scaled into a position where now, hey, more money, more problems, as they say, right? So what are we running into here? So we had a conversation, he and I, um, maybe two months ago now, something mm -hmm. like that. And uh, occasionally every six months or so, we'll catch up, but I'll be just blown away with what he's accomplished and the problems that he's run into. And the authenticity of this, right, is the real beauty of, of it for me because mm -hmm. it's like the only way you could know this is because you've walked into that situation yourself. Oh right? yeah, a newbie can't know about this, right? So it's just it's amazing feedback. It's awesome to hear about. Um, I'm glad I'm not the one doing it because these problems are <laughs> are big. So, Ken, thanks for being here. I really wanted to bring that kind of conversation to our audience. That was that was the main reason why I wanted us to get on board here. So let's let's go back in time. Um, and talk about building that web design agency. You scaled up to, you were starting out at a, probably a lower um, price ticket, right? And then built up to five figure projects where you were doing ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 web design projects, right? What was yeah. the biggest mindset challenge you remember facing as you made that move into the high ticket marketplace? It was just not knowing if a deal was going to close, right? So um, mm. I think everybody was kind of at the time throwing out these ideas that you can sell these websites for five, 10, uh, sometimes upwards of $20,000. <clears> I think the problem mm. was that was just an idea in everybody's head until people were actually going out there and doing it right. And that was the biggest thing for me. And, um, it was just like refining the sales process because not only was I not sure if it was going to close, like the first 15 didn't close. And so I knew there was issues with the sales process and just slowly over time, um, tweaked everything, refined it in each part of the presentation and leading up to the presentation and the follow-up. And then eventually the numbers uh, started to go into my favor. Let's dig into that a little bit because I remember us talking in the long ago time about direct mail. Yeah. Tell us about the kind of package. Don't, don't have to share anything proprietary, but the kind of package, what did it look like? 
feel like that you sent to a prospect? I mean, how did you even choose? Let's start with that. Who to send it to? Um, yeah. So the, the direct mail was like our biggest, um, deal flow, uh, piece in terms of marketing easily. Like we were bringing in, I think at, at our peak, it was like, I think I had like 45 presentations booked for, for the one month, <clears throat> excuse me, I think probably 30 plus of them are coming from mail pieces. Okay. So the way that that worked was I would go out and, and try and source different uh, companies that were, let's say, uh, doing a uh, million dollars or more than a million dollars in sales. And the only way we could really tell uh, that was based on their assets. So we would look at, did they have an office? Did they have trucks? Did they have multiple employees? Did they have multiple people working as contractors for them? Um, and we worked a lot with like home service agencies. So that would be like a HVAC was a, a really big one. Mm -hmm. um, did they have a lot of uh, air conditioning contractors, for example? Um, and that's how you could tell the type of revenue that was coming into the business. That was all really intensive in terms of doing that research. So eventually I kind of outsourced that um, to like a, a marketing assistant who did a lot of that work. Um, but I, I found the list that you're buying from these different data companies are just awful. Like the, the yeah. quality of the lead was so bad um, that there was really no other way around it other than to go out there and then find what we were looking for, set our own criteria. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually over time, that's what really brought in those quality leads. The other big one too was um, a, a, like association groups. So if anybody's selling like um, any type of service to a specific clientele, so we'll say like um, a home service agencies, a, a good one I always use more than likely there's some type of association for that group. So like there's an HVAC association, there's a plumber's association, uh, there's going to be a, like a renovator's association, um, home builders association. There's all these different types of associations and you can join those associations, um, not as obviously um, a contractor or that type of company, but as somebody who's just like an associate who's joining in there um, to start conversation um, and potentially get clients from those groups, right? So, dude, I went to all of these different like chamber of commerce meetings and you come to find out your 15th agency in line for getting even a conversation, like never mind a deal. Like it yeah. was ridiculous. Like there's no way I'm going to show up to this stuff mm -hmm. and get leads or deals from it. Um, and I joined the associations, which was a much more targeted group. Mm -hmm. And we were getting like <laughs> so many deals because there's no one else there. It's pretty crazy. So, yeah. So when, when you couldn't find the data you wanted from data brokers and list companies, how many hours or, or how many minutes or what kind of time were you putting into finding the right kind of leads? I mean, how many trucks do you have? That's an unusual piece of data to be collecting. So it, it sounds like you just determined you need to drill down way deeper than most people are willing to go. Yeah, but you have to, right? Because mm -hmm. other than those, I, and I don't remember the criteria off the top of my head because it was a few years ago. But what, whatever um, they were, it's still non-standard data though. Yeah, exactly. The and the only way to, but the only, like what you're drilling for is uh, business revenue, right? Like, yeah. can I help this company? And can they afford my stuff? Well, how do I know they can afford my stuff? Because they have the revenue to prove that. How do you prove revenue without seeing it? You have to look yeah. at the different pieces that are physically in front of you. There's a tangible uh, you know, set of, of items that they'll have. It could be an office space with their logo. And then you know they're paying four grand month of rent for that. If they have multiple employees, you know they're paying... Um, uh, salaries, obviously, if they have trucks, they're paying for those yeah. trucks, they're paying maintenance on those trucks. Um, those are the different ways that we found were pretty much the best to determine some type of revenue numbers. Now, it's never going to be accurate, but all sure. we were really shooting for was we had like a program for, I think it was like agents or excuse me, companies that did 500,000 to a million because there was a huge pocket of those companies that were maybe yeah. just kind of at the, uh, above the startup level. Um, 
that were growing quickly. Maybe they were in like their second or third year mm -hmm. and they wanted help, but they couldn't necessarily afford like 2,500 bucks a month. So we would set together or put together a, a separate package for maybe like a thousand, 1250 a month mm -hmm. um, and charge them that smaller package just because there was so much opportunity available there. And they were, they weren't awful to work with, to be honest, the guys that are really bad to work with are like, they, they're doing like a hundred grand a year in sales. Mm -hmm. And even if you got them the work, they just don't have the infrastructure to, mm -hmm. to fulfill yeah. on it. Right. So we've, we've found similar types of things with our client. We have to help them so much with the infrastructure, which when they're remote, we can help them with that stuff, but they absolutely need it. Yeah. So I think the question that I'm, that I'm really asking here is, how much time did you spend developing one of those leads? Because that's what, I mean, it sounds like you might have had to do drive-bys to get some of this information. No, to be honest, we are like, none of our stuff was local because the, okay. the, um, the town I'm from, like I live in Toronto now, but initially I lived about an hour outside of Toronto mm -hmm. and there just wasn't the, yeah. the, the business there um, for me to justify just staying locally. So we were doing all of our stuff online Mm. Obviously, I'm in Canada. We were selling to the states and the U.S. as well. Um, so all of our research would be done through, um, let's say, like we were looking for HVAC companies. I would have a marketing assistant go through, put in the search term, like we'll use air conditioning Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. We're very far outside of Chicago. However, um, we would look at these different companies that are advertising on Google for these certain uh, keywords, right? Mm -hmm. So we knew that they were advertising. We knew that uh, a search term like that at a peak time when air conditioning is in demand, it's a high cost per click. So they're probably paying a good amount of money. Um, and then from there, we could dig deeper. That was kind of like the first set of criteria like, are they marketing? Do they have some interest in this? Yeah. Um, and, and do they have interest in online marketing? Because a lot of companies didn't even want a website. They were all referral based. Um, so we were using that as kind of like the first set of criteria from there. We would dig a little bit deeper into um, like that second set, which would be like, um, can they afford our services? How many trucks do they have? How many employees do they have um, from what we can see on their website? So the website will tell a story okay. based on what we can see. It'll show okay. the different trucks ideally. It'll show. And then even if you can't find that, a lot of times it'll have their address and you can look up their address and location and see like on Google Maps and actually see that okay. there's a pretty big office there. How much time did that take? I don't I don't remember to be honest. It was I know we were probably sending about 30 to 40 mail pieces per week. Um, and we would maybe spend a day or two constructing that list each week. So maybe a day and a half to come up with these yeah. 40 different leads, um, yeah. which sounds like a lot of time, but the quality of the lead is so much higher. That's it's right. kind of a no brainer. And the return on investment on that stuff is crazy. Like people think that spending, uh, we were spending maybe seven, $8 per mail piece to send out. Mm -hmm. um, sounds like a lot of money, but it's not when, our average client was probably paying us like twenty five to thirty thousand dollars annually right. because they're on a retainer. So the the return on investment for that is like insane. Like it's yeah. I don't think you'll find a higher return on investment in terms of the marketing. Right. Isn't that awesome? Like this is the thing that that delights yeah. me about Ken and his relentlessness, right? Mm -hmm. It's like I'm going down this path, I'm gonna plink off whatever I have to do, and I'm gonna improve on it until it works. Like yeah. I'm a little frightened by what you're going to do by the time you're 40, you know, yeah. <laughs> when you hit my age, it's, it's going to be scary. Maybe, I retire. Um, no, what, maybe. Yeah. What did that direct mail piece look like? I remember talking a long time ago about a three piece, um, mail out. Yeah. What we found was the, the, um, consecutive mail pieces didn't work like we thought they would. Um, and I think a lot of that just comes down to, people's attention and um, just the internet kind of changing a lot of stuff, right? So for example, I think like Dan Kennedy preaches sending consecutive mail pieces, um, which probably works if that's what he says. I wouldn't 
I wouldn't go against the grain on that, but just what yeah. we found personally for us, it didn't work as well. So um, we, we, what we found worked best was sending one, maybe two mail pieces at the most, if we were really interested in this company. And then from there, um, doing follow-up calls. Um, and the reason for that was, it's, it was really difficult to get a company to call us back. Um, it would happen out of those 40 mail pieces. I think maybe, maybe like two, one, two might call you back. Maybe, right. That might be on the high end. A lot of times it was zero. However, if you are relentless on a follow-up call and you're calling them really consistently, um, they answer the phone and it's no longer a cold call. It's no longer like, oh, hey, we sell this stuff too. It's more or less like we sent, what I would send was an actual book piece. Like I wrote out an actual book, um, once again, which sounds like a lot of work, but it's not considering that no one else did that and no one else will do that. And you are going to get that business if you write out a book. Like it's mm -hmm. pretty much written. So, um, we would send out a, a, a book and it wasn't long. It was like 120 pages. And it was um, just on like the, the marketing factors you want to have in place if you're a specific type of business. Mm -hmm. So we sent this book out um, through the mail. And what would, what would happen almost always when we would call them is they would say like, oh yeah, we ended up getting that. That was great. That was a, a, a brilliant idea. No one's ever done that. Um, and what what actually ended up working out in our favor was the fact that these guys were getting so many calls all the time. They're getting so many emails. So it was almost like these other companies that were doing, uh, taking the shortcut of like, um, I don't want to say scammy, but it's, it came off as scammy when you're sending 20 emails a day to these different businesses saying, you guys need our SEO services. And they're getting these phone calls saying the same thing. So it's in the back of their head. They're just like, I'm not, I'm not going to buy from somebody who's sending this uh, template email out to all these other companies. So it almost acted as like branding for us that like, oh, hey, we need this. We're just waiting for the right person to come along. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found worked really well. Is we just took like a different approach. Um, and the, the, uh, aside from that, writing a book is like, I don't know, it's kind of what human nature just has like, it's when you see somebody's name on a book, they're like, Oh, that's the guy. Mm. That's the guy I'm going to work with. Um, that's the expert or whatever. Right. And you don't need like a degree. You're just writing your name on a book and then writing a book. So um, I think that's why Jason and I partnered up originally was because I was reading his, hmm. his book. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's a powerful effect. Fortunately, he knew his stuff, right? Because yeah. there's people out there writing books and you're going, dude, don't write any more books. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an easy way to tell if somebody really does know what they're talking about. Yeah. Yep. So you would, you would send these out, you would get some one or two calls back out of 40, let's say, and then you would have a relentless follow-up campaign mm -hmm. to talk to people and they would either say, no, we're not interested. We love the package, but we're not interested or we are interested. What would happen next? Because that, that gets you into a situation where you might have to present and you're presenting for a 10 or $15,000 website, which maybe they're not used to like what did that process look like and yeah, also so, what did you have to learn to be able to go up to that level so one caveat is we we actually stopped doing straight up web design um i think like the second year in business we would do it only if it was like you said like a super high-end project like mm -hmm. i wanted i wanted 10 grand net cash after all expenses in the bank if I was going to spend my time doing that because it just got like it just got out of hand if you're doing like even like a five grand project which is probably a lot of money by today's website standards because there's, the market is so flooded now but if you're doing that you have to understand you're getting paid once and you're going to get hit up constantly with like um it, it was ridiculous man like people were giving us uh, changes they wanted made in terms of like what shade blue. And we were literally, I was literally arguing with this guy one morning for like an hour that the shade of blue he wanted is the shade of blue that we added. And we're going over like, uh, mm -hmm. like whatever those, um, 
that uh, site is that you can see yeah. like what the yeah i'm like going over i'm sending him code it, it was so dumb like, this is how i'm spending yeah. my time right now like mm -hmm. i'm done with this so um yeah so we stopped doing a lot of the web design we try to get these clients on retainer um mm -hmm. I think, sorry, what was your other question in terms of like, what did that look like leading up yeah, to Yeah, just how did you, so you, you get this mail package, you get into a conversation with them, how do you move to a presentation? Now we're getting a picture of what that presentation turned out to be about, right? <clears throat> we're just yep. starting to get into that. Okay, so uh, after we set a time um, to book something and you wanna book it ideally as soon as possible, if you can get, if it's in the morning, try and get it for later that afternoon, mm -hmm. not the next day, if not even sooner, right? That's what I found because the show up rates obviously would drop off as the presentation date uh, moved further out. Yeah. So that's the main thing is you want to get them to show up. Um, in between when we booked the presentation and when we actually sat down, we were sending them content to frame ourselves once again as the experts. So I think I sent them, we had like one company, uh, the first company I think I ever worked with, we crushed it for. Like it was uh, crazy how much extra business we brought them. And like, so I sent them a case study and then in the case study, it included a testimonial. And we're sending that to them before we do the actual presentation, right? So that's kind of like the first touch point. On top of that, they already have our book which is another piece of content or touch point that they're reading through. Um, and that was enough to really pre-frame that presentation as like, um, this is somebody that I seriously would consider working with and paying good money to. And that probably allowed us to demand a higher price point. And it's, it's interesting if you compare that process to how most people were selling at that time. Mind you, once again, this is probably about three years ago. Um, most people were sending an email, relentlessly cold calling, and trying to close that company on the initial contact or call, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Much different process, a little bit more delayed out. Um, but I think it worked much more in our favor. Yeah, I don't think there's any question about that. Every time I've added more steps to a marketing process and a pre-sales process, I guess you could say, the better it works. Yeah, there's there's like book there's books written on this, right? Like in terms of um, one is spin selling, which uh, I didn't I didn't use the exact template that they laid out, but I definitely took some points from spin selling. Mm -hmm. But the whole theory or basis of that is that like as the sales um, value increases in terms of what you're demanding, mm -hmm. that process or that time length is typically going to increase or should ideally increase as well and there should be multiple touch points that yeah. you're bringing these people through um in order to keep qualifying them keep them interested um mm -hmm. and so that's i, I mean I, I don't know um if you guys talked about spin selling before but i remember that being a pretty key Sometimes. book um, that i'd read through yeah yeah it's a good one there, there are some folks i'm seeing a lot of folks lately funnel builders and the like talk about how um, it doesn't really matter what you say to people as long as they let you stay in touch, as long as you're in touch with that person. I mean, that's, and I'm not sure if I fall into that camp really, but yeah, they're not a hundred percent wrong. No, exactly. Know? Yeah. Because they are a little wrong um, because I, I do think there has to be, you want to be building to something, right? Yeah. Like you want to be, uh, if you're going to stay in contact, there has to be some type of value add Otherwise, it turns into like, why is this guy calling me again? Um, right. So you want to have some type of value add when you are contacting them. So let's say, for example, somebody was falling off and I could feel them falling off. And you're like, mm -hmm. okay, what can I do to keep this person um, engaged? Like try and uh, draw back to a previous conversation you had about maybe a problem that they had mm -hmm. and like get them um, engaged by sending them some content. Uh, you can yeah. shoot a video that you would use on your blog anyways and add that into um, your, you, you, I mean, you could be, it could be content that, that you can add into like um, that could be found whatever on YouTube or on your blog, but you can shoot that specifically for that individual that was having that problem and then mm -hmm. use it as content um, yeah. later, right? That's just propri proprietary that, that people would come across and, and get right. value from. So, 
Um, there's a few ways to do that. I, I will say too, the other thing we did or that I did, um, I was writing for magazines. Mm -hmm. So I was writing for like these different trade magazines. Um, and if a book didn't work in terms of um, showing the value that I could add and, and kind of just positioning me as that expert individual, writing for a trade magazine would definitely do that. There, yeah. There's probably a lot of them that are looking for writers. And they're probably willing to pay writers. We were getting a lot of leads from that as well. So I could send them a copy of a magazine that I had written an article in that they most likely read anyways or they for yeah. sure have heard of. Mm -hmm. um, that was really strong too. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. In the presentations, you ran into all kinds of objections, right? I remember you telling me like, uh, oh, you're not in town, right? Because yeah. you're not in Chicago and that. What, what kinds of things did you run into and how did you overcome those? Or did you just filter those people out? Yeah, there was... I mean, the biggest obstacle we were probably facing was we were going up against local agencies. Hmm. So like I was trying to sell a contractor in Wisconsin on why they should work with us and they're meeting with two other eight. And like, I don't care if you're doing a webinar or whatever, you're not going to have the yeah. same leverage as like someone who has a face-to-face -face meeting. So that's where I found like adding in these um, expert pieces of content and just positioning yourself beforehand and then just really letting them know that you're in this market space or in this niche because we were the only ones that were contacting these guys that were you know the HVAC experts or the home renovation experts right like we were the only ones reaching out to them under that premise everyone else is an everything agency mm -hmm. that does everything for everyone Yep. It doesn't really speak to the language of somebody who's looking for um, somebody who can solve their problem. And I knew what the problems were because I had had so many of these conversations that I knew what they were going to say before they said it. Right. That's, a pr that's a pretty big advantage as well. Yeah. And it's, like I said, like you're never going to have the same leverage as somebody who was physically shaking their hand in the meeting with them. But you can come pretty close or even overcome it by positioning yourself properly. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Best sale you made in that agency? Um, the best sale I made was maybe one of the worst sales I made because we, I, I worked with, uh, we had a government contract with a company um, and it, it just opened my eyes and how, in terms of like how much of a mess just government is when they, and they should not be associated with business. Just like, and that, that might be a little forward, but it was like, I was uh, looking at this going like, <laughs> it was crazy, man. Like they were spending, um, with the previous company they worked with, they were spending 10 grand a month on pay-per-click and getting nothing. Like get Like this company was, um, basically justifying working with them by showing them we spent 10 grand of your money and here's the traffic we sent you. Well, anybody can drive traffic with 10 grand, right? So yeah. we went in there and it cleaned everything up and we were getting like way better results for less money. Mm -hmm. And then we're still like on our case, like why aren't we getting better results? Um, and I don't, it was, it was, it just became a hassle of constantly like, we know you're doing good, but you have to do better. And your, your hands are kind of tied at that point because you're, I think they're paying us like a few grand a month, which is great. Like that's a nice income. But um, at that point, your hands are kind of tied because I'm not your in-house marketing person. And that's what you're looking for. Mm. Yeah. Even though we're crushing it for them. Um, and even though we got them all these results, I just think they're, the nature was um, they were just constantly looking for more. We need more. We need more. Um, without really look, and that's kind of like the business you're in though, unfortunately, when you're doing marketing is people are, or these companies are looking for a result, and you mm -hmm. owe them that result, but you, you don't get praise. You only hear from them when something's <laughs> not working. Yeah. 
So that's kind of that you have to understand that going like you can't come into this type of business looking for a pat on the back or constant reassurance because you're never going to get it. It's mm -hmm. up to you to keep those lines of communication open. Um, yeah. And if you keep those lines of communication open, it's going to like, you're just going to get lukewarm responses constantly. And lukewarm is not bad. Yeah. Oh. If, that make, if that makes sense. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so we heard a little bit earlier about pr some problems as you scale the web agency, like the people, the guy complaining about the color. And who knows what his monitor settings were tuned to, right? So he's seeing a slightly different shade or something. Yeah, like yeah. What kind of other blocks, problems did you encounter as you hit scaling points, you know? And, and, and that could be internal staffing as well, right? Costs go up, fulfillment, right? Yeah, I think the biggest issue that everyone <clears throat> will eventually run into as they grow the business is finding the profit margin while scaling. Mm -hmm. So as you scale, there's a, there's a few different parts to this business, right? Like, so the main thing that I found that worked really well for us was what I just mentioned was keeping the lines of communication open and that you could literally buy yourself six months plus of working with a client and not delivering results as long as you kept those lines of communication open and let them know like, this is what we're doing. This is what we're trying. These are some of the results we've got for you. And as long as you were doing that, you're creating I found that they yourself. would put a lot of trust into you and into what you're doing. And they're like, this is the guy. You just have to give him a little bit more time. Right. And obviously at some point you have to deliver on what you're saying um, or what you originally sold them on. But as anyone knows in marketing, like the stuff does take time. It's another thing you have to pre-frame them on properly. It's like, this isn't going to drive results right away. Right. Um, so that's, that was one of the main things. And with that said, as you scale, it's impossible to keep in touch with all of these different clients. So you can't be the one man shop that's mm -hmm. talking to, we had like 30, 40 something clients on retainer. Um, I wasn't able to constantly keep in touch with all of these people at all times. Mm -hmm. So you have to hire someone to do that, right? You have to hire multiple people to do that that's, and have them uh, become dedicated to these clients while you go out and scale the business. So as the, like the business owner, my job for me personally was to market and sell and bring on more projects. In order to do that, I had to free up my time, which meant hiring people to uh, keep in communication with these clients that we already have and keep them on board. And on top of that, you have, to, you have the fulfillment side of things. So you have to find people to fulfill the services, to do the work. So that could be a PPC contractor, search marketing, Facebook marketing, web designer, all that stuff, right? Um, so the, there's, as you scale this thing up, what you're going to find is when you're, when you have, let's say like 30, 40,000 a month in sales, you're almost making the same net profit that you would have been. Yeah. Had you kept it at like 12, 15,000, um, mm -hmm. just because the, the profit gets eaten up with the salary. Mm -hmm. Um, it just depends on where you want to take the business at that point. That's really up to you. Um, if you want to stay small, and kind of work as like that one man shop that is going to keep in contact with people. It's going to be a little bit more of, uh, it's, it's going to be more involved for you personally in, in terms of working in the business. Um, if you want to grow it to that 30 to $40,000 per month mark, your time's going to be a little bit more freed up, but you're not going to be killing it. Like you're going to be not going to be making that much more. Right, that you were um, at half the revenue, right? So that's all stuff you have to consider that I don't think a lot of people really know about when they're getting into this stuff because it is a really hands-on, intensive business. Um, yeah. That that line of communication is was the biggest thing that I found. That was the biggest surprise for me. I would have thought if I could have just provided them results, they would have been happy. But we had people that were literally or companies that were literally getting results from other agencies that left and came to us because the other agency wasn't communicating what was going on. Mm, and I, yeah. when I would look at what was actually happening, like this isn't half bad, like they're doing um, 
pretty decent job. Here, they can improve. Here's what we can improve for you. Um, and they left and they came to us just because like they didn't feel comfortable. Yeah. Perception <clears throat> is reality, huh? Yeah, that's an interesting. Yeah, it, de- point. it definitely is. Yeah, and and the thing too is like they don't know this stuff, right? So they don't know about marketing or, or online marketing or pay per click or so for the most part they don't. A couple of them knew a little bit, but um, so it's up to you to like educate them throughout that process too. Hmm. So oh, they have yeah. no baseline for understanding the measures of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, ex- exactly. There's no baseline. There's no foundation. They don't know what's good and what's bad. So you have to kind of educate them on what's good and what's bad. Um, and then as you progress, continuously educate them on what's going on. And that's yeah. how you're going to keep like our average client stayed with us like 18 months to two years, which is crazy. Like in, in, mm-hmm. in the search marketing world, the average was like three to six months. Well, and yeah, we're they're, way they're past that. 10 to 50 calls a day from competitors to try and sell them other folks. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. month stick rate is, that's insane. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's 18 months. And then uh, a lot of them was even like two years. Like, and I still have clients to this day from that business. I'm doing um, another business full time now, but I still have a couple of clients that we work with <clears throat> full time because it's just like, so we just, we get them results. The communication is automated at this point. They've been working with us for so long. It's what's important to realize too, is like, it's up to them at that point. Once they make a decision, like it's a, it's a trust based decision. They're like, this is our guy. This is who we're going to work with for them to change at that point. They don't want to change. Like they're cheering for you right? to to do the, they're like, I don't want to have to deal with this again. It's almost like an interview process where they're bringing somebody on and you have to think of your presentation as like the job interview. And when you're bringing them on or or when they're bringing you on and they're working with you, like I said, like there's a huge amount of trust that's built up throughout that process. Six months later, they don't want to have to be like, okay, see ya. Now we have to go through this again. Like that's another thing that's on their plate as a business owner that they don't want to do. So the odds are in your favor for them to stick with you. You just have to figure out like that process of how to tweak all those factors in your favor to keep them on board. And of course, they have to be making fifty, a hundred thousand a month or more to be able to sustain that expense. Yeah, it. I mean, it, it depends on the company, right? But um, yeah, the, I mean, well, a company shouldn't be working with you and then the revenue drops off, right? Like that's. Right. <laughs> so ideally, they are already at that point, and then that's increasing. Um, and then on top of that, um, you have to keep in mind like the, the different sales cycle of a business. So with HVAC, one issue re- we ran into was there's kind of two really hot seasons, literally one hot season and one cold season, but a hot season right. in terms of a sale. Mm-hmm. Um, there was like the air conditioning season and then there is the <clears throat> furnace season, right? For, for states that are obviously in the North and in Canada. Um, so what you need to do is kind of educate them on that sales cycle and how the process works and how the leads are going to be distributed, um, mm-hmm. not necessarily even throughout the year. They're going to come in at, at certain points. Um, but at the same time, let them know I wouldn't stop the marketing in, let's yeah. say, like March or April when it's not crazy out um, because that's going to – what we're doing here is, has a snowball effect. So the work that we put in through – um, February, March, April is going to really work well for us come June, July, August when a lot of those calls come in. Yeah. But that's once again, education based. They don't know that stuff in right. their head. It's hmm. like we're paying for marketing in March and we're not getting leads. This guy's, um, fired. And we've got four other people promising us the moon every day. Yeah, so exactly. There's um, actual results versus other people's promised ideas of results yeah 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 and they're they'll come to you with those proposed solutions Mm -hmm. and say this is what company x said that they can do for us by email they're potentially in india but i (laughs) right but i think they're they might they might have a point here and you then you have you're kind of like battling like no that's not true um, mm-hmm. and once again, that's a trust based thing. They don't know who to trust. They're leaning towards you because they've already hired you, but 
they want you to win them over again and again and again. So, right. Hmm. right. There's another reason. <laughs> to, so you got out of that business because of these time suck issues and frustrations and whatnot. Um, and I just left, couldn't make any more money. I, I left in, uh, I didn't necessarily leave, but I stopped mm -hmm. growing that business in January of 2016 because I was, I knew what that business was about at that point. And I knew like everything I'm telling you now, I'd already learned up to that point. And I just knew what the future looked like. And I remember we had like 45 presentations booked. Um, at this point, I had a small office that I was working out of. And I knew that we typically close 25 to 30% of presentations. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So, um, at that point, I knew we were going to start bringing, because the, the, the marketing we had in place was really starting to flood in. We had mail, we had Facebook ads. I had these different outlets that I was writing for, as I mentioned, and we had referrals coming in. And each month, the presentation amount and, and the deal flow was growing and growing and growing. And just said, I have to make a decision if this is what I want to do for a long time now, because if this is what I want to do now, I have to go start hiring more people. I have to get a bigger office mm -hmm. and this is something I'm going to have to commit to for years. Mm -hmm. And it's, that wasn't what I wanted to do. So I, yeah. I kind of had to like step back and figure out what I wanted to do. Makes sense. So what, what helped you go into e-commerce then after that agency experience? What, what was your dream that you wanted to create? I was just kind of looking for what, <clears throat> what I wanted, what I what work that I would be engaged with and that I would find fun because the agency stuff was not fun at that point. Mm -hmm. It was just, I was just finding myself just constantly putting out fires mm -hmm. and like I said, like, that's not what I wanted to do for the next few years. So I was kind of just tinkering around trying to figure out like, well, what do I want to do then? And I don't think you can really figure that out until you've done something. Like, mm -hmm. okay, it's not this, it's not this, it's not that. You can read all, like, I was reading books on like, how to find your passion. And it's like, yeah. that it, it did nothing for me. I had to actually go out there and do something and be like, is this something I'm engaged with? Like, um, yeah. do I find myself waking up and not necessarily like, yay, this is going to be so exciting, but just like being able to sit down and do the work um, and not moan and groan about it. Because they're like, this is not that bad. Like it's actually pretty interesting stuff, right? Yeah. It's not going to be like all happy times, um, but so it's this something is like, This is one of my favorite authors, authors here, Cal Newport. Yeah, it's a good book. Yeah. And his, his book, um, So Good They Can't Ignore You. Yeah so much about the do not follow your passion don't follow your heart yeah, don't yeah do the thing and you'll see what you're passionate about you'll become passionate about it as you become skilled and i just love that that resonates so strongly with one of my favorite authors that's awesome yeah yeah i've read both those books deep work's really mm -hmm. good too um yeah. yeah it's true like with i mean you can't you you can't just figure pick something out and be like, this is what, because you have no idea what you're getting into until you're actually yeah. into like even e-commerce, the stuff I'm doing now as the business has grown, it's not what I thought I would be doing. Like I thought I was going to be doing product development and marketing. Um, mm -hmm. and, just, and that's somewhat of what I do, but I've found myself in much more of like a business owner type of CEO role now where I'm, yeah managing cash flow and doing stuff that's um you would never hear about like in an online course or in like a find your passion blog post um right. so that's um yeah I mean, I mean i had to make a decision if that's what i wanted to do it wasn't and then one thing i did get into was i wanted to work with agencies and show them what we had done mm -hmm. um and that's what I thought that would be pretty cool because it's something that I like to talk about. I liked, I liked the idea and I, I actually been in the trenches for years at that point and done it. Mm -hmm. So I felt I was qualified. I wasn't just another fly by night guy that would yeah. sell them on whatever. But what I realized was like, in order to do that, in order to make money and sustain that model, you had to sell people on a dream and be like, you can retire in three months and leave your job. And that's, I didn't want to do that. Like I didn't want to be that guy. 
um, with Lamborghinis in my garage and that. So I, I had to, I had to go into that space and do that to realize like, once again, I thought it was what I wanted to do, but it, mm-hmm. it, it definitely wasn't. Um, so yeah. we did end up working with a couple mid-size agencies. Um, and like I did consulting for them, which was cool, but that was like a what step a back. Agency? Sorry, say it again. What is a mid-size agency in this kind of space? Um, probably the same size that we were at. They, they had um, a bunch of employees. They had a lot of clients. I think majority of people that are starting this that are calling themselves an agency or a consultant are okay. one-man shops. Sure. Um, and that's, that's like who floods majority of, of the market, right? Sure. Um, and they're the ones who are blasting with these cold emails and f- cold phone calls and that. Um, yeah. And to sell to those people, which make up the huge, <clears throat> like I said, majority of the market, you've got to sell them on, get out of your job. Here's how to make 20 grand this month and get yeah. rich and quick and all that stuff. Right. So our, all automatically, because I didn't want to do that, my potential um, revenue and, and potential um, for the business nice. was like mm-hmm. cut off immediately. Yep. Um, and like I said, like we did work with a few already established agencies um, mm-hmm. in terms of like a consulting role, but that's not a long term. Like that wasn't a, right. a business. That was me acting as a consultant, and there was no leverage to that because I'm mm-hmm. doing calls and giving advice on this stuff. Yeah. Um, and getting paid by the hour, right? So mm-hmm. um, I probably spent a, f- a couple, a few months, three, three months maybe trying that stuff out before I was like, this is not what I want to do. Yep. As you've grown your e-commerce business, what tell us more about the unexpected problems that you've run into or the, the changes in focus where you thought, okay, I'm going to be picking products and coming up with stuff and marketing and then Oh dear, you know, something happened as you grew, you sell, you sold more and more stuff, right? Then inventory management becomes an issue and that leads directly to cash flow, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So once again, I went in, I tend to do this is I'll go into something um, completely blind and just pile drive into it. Like I'm all in and you find out really, really quickly, like what the problems are going to be. Um, And and you really get a hands-on real world experience of like, this is what I'm doing now. And this is all the issues and they're coming at you really fast. Mm -hmm. So the best example I can use in the e-commerce world is the sales cycle. So we do um, probably about, 50 plus percent, maybe 50, 55, maybe <clears throat> close to 60 percent of our sales during three months of the year. We'll say 50 percent of our sales mm-hmm. during three months of the year. So that's November, December, and January, like the holiday season when a lot of people are on their computers and buying. Um, what you find because of that is it's a completely different business model than the agency world where I'm getting paid on retainer upfront on the first of every month before I do anything, before I touch anything, I already have the money in my bank account. Mm -hmm. The e-commerce side of things is the exact opposite where I'm paying the money upfront. Um, and I'm, I'm paying shipping expenses. I'm paying marketing expenses. I'm paying my employees Mm -hmm. before I see any money coming in, which puts a huge strain on the cash flow. Now add to that the fact that I have to buy 50% of my annual inventory. So it's 50% of the inventory that I'm going to sell throughout the year. I have to buy in May and June. So yeah. we placed our orders already this month for Christmas. Mm-hmm. You have to have a ton of cash flow saved up. Yeah. Which is like no one is going to tell you about that when they're selling you the right. Lamborghini course. That's exactly. Yeah. There's no, there's no secret module on that yeah. one. So that's you, all you stuff. Six hundred thousand dollars in cash. Well, then you can yeah. get started. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Not so a favorable equation. We had to. Um, I had to figure all of that out on my own, and mm-hmm. yeah, it's tough. It's really tough. Like you gotta, you have. You have to have a, a lot of cash flow saved, and you got to understand the sales cycle of the business. You have to understand at what points you can release new products 
at what point you have to cut off the release of new products because now we're putting all our money towards this. And, and there's, there's different ways you can go about it, right? So I'm trying to grow this business off of straight profit. I don't know that we will this year. We may have to take out like a little bit of money, but it's, it's going to be almost nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but there's companies that are like f constantly 40, 50 grand in debt yeah. because they're growing the business, which is depending on the person is potentially a lot of money, right? Like I don't want to that, be. That's 40, what Amazon 50. does. Amazon's never taken a profit before. Yeah, exactly. And so that's a, di a totally different business than um, the agency stuff. And then on top of that, I mean, there's companies that are f constantly running at 500 grand in debt, right? Mm -hmm. In the same space, they're making a lot of money in terms of the revenue. Um, but you don't see that in a, like, like I said, like a, this is, I keep touching on this because Jason and I have had this conversation before about yeah. like the sales letters of like, you can make X amount per month you're not seeing anything behind the scenes of like what's what the structure of that business actually looks like. You're not seeing yeah. if they're growing off of profit, if they're off of debt, if the business is profitable, if it's not profitable, if it's mm. potentially never going to be profitable and they're just looking right. for an exit. Um, that's really common. Like I had a friend I just spoke with yep. today. He got an offer for his business for 2.5 million. He's been in business four years. He's never been profitable. Mm -hmm. Probably if he was still continuing to run it, he never would be profitable. Yet somebody came in and bought the business for made an offer for a few million dollars. Right. Yeah. This is all, it doesn't seem like normal for that's what I thought. I'm like, this is, this is a kind of like a weird world where <laughs> yeah. you're taking on debt. You're not making money, but the business somehow still has a valuation that's higher than any other business I've ever seen. It, you know, um, it, it sounds like farming to me. Yeah. <laughs> Very similar to the way farming work. I grew up on a farm, so I can't help but draw the comparisons there. It's huge outlays all year long. 96, 98% of the farms in America run on credit, huge lines of credit. And um, yeah, you can have huge revenues. The margins are pretty small. Yeah. It's, it's just, uh, well, you're... So the land, there's value to the land. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you can't sell it unless you want to be out of business, but there's value there. So it's yeah. just very weird equations being built all the way. Exactly. Through. And that's stuff that, you, how do you know that going into this, right? right. Like you don't. Um, now the way, because I'm growing the business off of profits, yeah, we'll probably be pretty profitable by third year, which would be yeah. um, pretty soon. So that's, that's mm -hmm. a good thing, obviously. Um, however, I came from a unique circumstance where I had a lot of money because I yeah. had a cash flow business previously. Right. So if I were to sell a course or whatever, that would have to be a caveat. I would have to note and be like, Oh, the reason right. I did this is because I had money previous and I wasn't going into debt. Um, yeah. otherwise the, the way it looks for a lot of people is much different. You're going to have to go into debt probably yeah. for a while. And if you don't exit, maybe you can be profitable by your fifth year. Um, yeah. and, may, and when I say profitable, I mean, you can be very profitable. If you're doing sure. $5 million in sales and your net margins are 25%, that's a nice living. That's a very nice living, right? But it's going to take a long time to build to that point. Um, and the, the other thing you touched on that was really key there was um, saying like the, the, the margins are thin or whatever. It's weird once again, because the margins aren't necessarily thin in this business. Like our mar our net profit hmm. margin is over 25%. That's, that's after I pay employees and for a physical product with shipping, yeah, that's awesome. it's really good. Yeah. Especially for the revenue numbers that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, however, the net profit you make doesn't equate to the money that's in the bank account. It, oh, right. Because of the cash flow cycles. Mm -hmm. So how are we making 30% net profit on a, a good revenue number, yet we still may need to borrow money yeah. throughout the year? Um, yeah. And like I said, it won't be a ton of debt. So it's not, it's not uh, an issue at all. But yeah, like how does that work that your bank account can, can be very <laughs> low, yet you have a business that's very profitable 
and has these really high revenues, right? Um, and it's all just that about. sales cash flow cycle. You don't yeah. know that you have to buy six months worth of inventory at one shot after we literally just finished a reorder. So we reordered. Yeah. And then at the same time, like two weeks later, after we placed that reorder to last us a couple months, we had to order six months out again because you have time for siege um, freight takes that takes a month or two, the manufacturing yeah. time. So literally you're placing your orders for the holiday season, like I said, in June. Yeah. Um, and then you just placed an order, let's say like at the end of May. Um, so you're like, that's how the sales cash flow cycle works. And I don't yeah. think there's anything that can really prepare you for that unless you come from like that background, your family business or whatever. And you're mm -hmm. fortunate that you've experienced that. Uh, but I think for most people, they don't know about that. Uh, that was too scary for me. I couldn't be a farmer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so is that the biggest warning that you have for people, Ken, who maybe want to start an e-commerce business, have a good head on their shoulders and maybe hopefully a clear brand in mind that revenue is alone is, is just a ridiculous number to base a decision on. The revenue and profit margin is, mm -hmm. is kind of ri ridiculous, right? Like kind of lies um, <laughs> okay. in terms of what you're, it depends what you're, <coughs> excuse me. It depends what you're looking for. Like, if you're looking to get to like, uh, I know people personally, and I've seen in these groups and stuff, people that are trying to leave their jobs through an e-commerce business, I wouldn't do that. Like, that's not, if you're trying to leave your job, um, you won't, you, you, you do that through a cash flow, through something that's going to accumulate cash flow and put money in your bank account mm -hmm. really consistently. Right. Like that would be the goal. Yeah. An e-commerce business obviously doesn't follow that model. Mm -hmm. So that's not the plan that I would use. If you're trying to grow a long-term business for something that you enjoy doing, then it's, it could uh, potentially work out really well. Right. It just depends on what your goal is. But I know that like, yeah. like I said, like majority of the people that are in this space are like just getting started. They want to leave a job that they hate. And they saw this really cool video that, uh, if they sell on Amazon or Shopify that you can get rich really fast and I can make a million dollars really quickly. And so that's probably who I would heed a warning to. Yeah. Well, and if you start with 3 million in the bank, you can make another million with this kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Really quickly. Sure. Why not? But yeah, that's just not the position. Yeah. And people need to understand what you're seeing is never what this situation actually is <laughs> yeah. like, in, a hundred, like a hundred grand is nothing in e-commerce. Like, and, and think about how difficult it would be for someone to stack up a hundred thousand dollars cash in the bank in today's yeah. world. And then on top of that to realize like, Oh, that's nothing in e-commerce. Like your reorders if for a big business grow super. If the business is growing fast and we're up like 350 or 370% over last year, nice. that's, crazy fast growth yeah. so think about um how much extra inventory you have to order um and just understand that a, a huge chunk of money and even these numbers that you're seeing on these screenshots with someone's i mean people are selling courses where they're making 30 or, or doing 30 grand a month in sales and they're selling a course you're going that's nothing you can, yeah. you you haven't even scratched the surface of what's possible and you're already jumping ship to sell people yeah. how, to, how to do nothing as well. Like it's, it's yeah. mind boggling. <laughs> There's a lot yeah. of that in the, in wow. the coaching and training world. Isn't I, that stuff is out of, con it's out of control at this. I, I can't, I mean, all of YouTube's pre-roll ad inventory is bought out. I swear by guys teaching me how to get rich. It's crazy. <laughs> It's so crazy to me. Hmm. Well, this has been incredible, Ken. Thanks for very the look behind the curtain. Do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. Cool. So, yeah, thanks for telling it like it is, keeping it real, letting us see something that most people don't get a chance to see. Yeah. It's yeah. fun to talk about, man. Yeah. It really I've, is. I've had a blast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Can you stick around for another couple minutes after we go off the air? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, that's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with Carlos Redlick, copywriter extraordinaire. And I think we're done. <laughs>